welcome everyone to the discussion of the rollout of Maryland's first in the nation. Thank you. Statewide phone ban um, on, phone, on polystyrene phone con containers. Um, I'm Martha Ainsworth. I'm chair of the Maryland Sierra Club's Zero Waste Committee. Uh, the Maryland Sierra Club worked with other environmental groups and bill sponsors to get the statewide EPS phone ban passed in 2019. Carolyn, um, Carolyn Parsa is going to be the co-moderator. She's the chair of the Howard County Sierra Club and a member of the Sierra Club statewide zero waste team. Um, she and I will be moderating the discussion um, today and Gary Young of the Maryland Sierra Club chapter will also be providing technical support. I think you already met him. These are very challenging times and we deeply appreciate the extraordinary efforts of the many public servants on this call who are doing their utmost to protect the public and, um, and the environment and to keep us safe. Thank you very much. We hope this event will help you to help ease your stress on this rollout and re reduce your workload in the end. Thank you for joining us. This event was specifically set up to provide information to staff of county agencies involved in implementation of the new statewide foam food container ban um, to facilitate communication with the Maryland Department of Environment to, to assess the experience of some Maryland jurisdictions that already have a foam ban in place. What we can learn from them and to provide an opportunity for all of you to pose questions at MDE and those who've already implemented a county phone ban. I'm pleased to say that they are representatives of departments from 13 Maryland counties that do not yet have a phone ban on this, uh, on this call um, here today. Um, we have two panelists, uh, John Sullivan, who's manager of the um, resource management program Land and Materials Administration of the Maryland Department of the Environment. And he is joining us by phone. Um, we have Marilyn Noman, the Associate Director of Resource Recovery Division of the Prince George's County Department of the Environment. Hi, Marilyn. <laughs> um, and the third panelist, um, Sharon Pawlowski of Anne Arundel County Bureau of Environmental Health could not make it. She wanted to, um, but she sent some materials um, from the Anne Arundel uh, County phone ban rollout to share, which I'll do after uh, Marilyn speaks. And she's willing to um, respond to questions of their experience to date. The Anne Arundel County phone ban um, was launched on February 28th of this year, uh, just before the COVID epidemic got really intense. Hey, I'm Carolyn Parsa, chair of the Howard County Sierra Club, and also a member of the Sierra Club Zero Waste Team. Martha will be presenting a short overview of the rationale for and the substance of the phone ban. After which we'll be hearing from our panelists at a back to back five to seven minutes each and then we'll open up the floor for questions. Um, please uh, as a matter of uh, procedure please send your questions to the Q&A and reserve the chat for technical difficulties. Um, if you can identify yourself, the question and whom it's directed to, and um, then we will be monitoring the Q&A for um, in, the, in the end. So, and also this meeting is being recorded and it will be available for those who couldn't attend today. Thank you. Very good. Okay, to get started, I want to address two central questions. Um, and reassure you with evidence on compliance from counties that already have a phone ban. We can have the first slide here. First, why would why we want to uh, ban phone food containers? Phone food containers are among the top 10 items collected in beach cleanups. They're lightweight, they blow into the rivers and the streams, they break into smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller pieces to last forever. Um, they're almost impossible to clean up at that point when they get um, into the microplastics. They pose a harm to wildlife who consume them 
and we consume some of the fish in the sea. We're very concerned about that and the environment. There are often fatal results for wildlife that consume um, lots of plastic. They feel full, but they're actually not being nourished. Um, there's growing harm to human health that's being recognized. I don't know if you all saw this. Um, the Consumer Reports issue, here we go. The Consumer Reports issue from June 2020. Cover story, how to eat less plastic. You may be consuming as much as a credit card's worth of plastic a week. Plas microplastics are now in house dust. We're actually inhaling them as well as consuming them in our food. Um, so this is the styrofoam, the little bits of styrofoam um, are part of that problem. Um, the styrofoam food containers are not recyclable and not biodegradable. They take up a lot of space in the landfill. They're mostly air, but they, so they don't weigh very much. They do take up a lot of space. And above all, there are plenty of alternatives less harmful to human health than to and to the environment. So let's just move to what, what's in the statewide foam ban. So first of all, what's banned? Well, there's two components uh, to the law. First is about the sale of expanded polystyrene food service products um, in the state. That is banned as of July 1st. There's been no change in that date. As of July 1st, no person business, whatever, person and legally also includes businesses, uh, can actually sell those polystyrene food service products, uh, retail sale. Now, the other part is the sale or provision of food or beverages in an expanded polystyrene food service product by a food service business or school. Um, now, that originally was supposed to go into effect as of July 1st, but because of the um, epidemic, the COVID-19 epidemic, um, these uh, food service businesses are being given until October 1st to use up their stock. What's a food service business? There you have it on the slide. It's a business that sells or provides food or beverages for consumption on or off the pre premises. And it does include institutional cafeterias, um, including those um, by or on behalf of state or local government. You know, the school cafeterias, cafeterias and hospitals and businesses, all of those are included. Next slide, thank you. Now here we have a list of what an expanded um, polystyrene food service product includes. Um, it's made of expanded polystyrene product um, used for selling um, or serving food or beverages, and it's intended by the manufacturer to be single use basically. And then there are some examples here, food containers, plates, hot and cold beverage cups, cartons for eggs and other food. There are two uh, main exemptions on expanded polystyrene um, food products. One is food and beverages that have been packaged before they reach the food service business. You've probably seen um, uh, those soups that come in um, foam cups that are sealed already, just pour hot water in them, um, that kind of thing. Um, those are exempted. And also the trays for um, uncooked butchered or butchered meat, fish, poultry, or seafood that you get at the supermarket, they're allowed to use those. Of course, the ban does not affect non-foam polystyrene products. Those are your number six plastics um, that are not foam. And now here's really one of the main reasons that we're meeting here today. What, who, who publicizes and enforces the ban? So there are partners here. One is MDE and the other is a unit of your county government. So MDE is responsible for public education and an outreach campaign before and during implementation. Uh, and during implementation, it just means going forward through time. Um, that would include um, the contact with food service businesses, um, contact with schools, all of this in consultation with um, local county government units and schools as well, as uh, school um, institutions, distribution of information by internet and web-based resources and news releases and news events. And then a unit of county government 
includes a local, local health or environmental department. Um, I think departments of public works have a lot to do, um, have also have environmental roles. Um, so they are included there. Now there's a penalty. Uh, first of all, um, no penalty can be imposed um, without first a notice of violation and giving the, giving the um, food service business or the retailer three months to correct it, up to $250 per violation. And um, the unit of local government is supposed to notify MDE of any, of any violation. So that's the gist of the law, and I, I'm, I'm sure that um, John Sullivan is going to be saying more about that. Um, let me just finish with um, a note of encouragement. You're going to be very pleased to know that what we found in the jurisdictions that have already um, rolled out their phone bans as much as four years ago, that when businesses are aware that there's a ban where they're fully informed, the compliance rate is very high. Um, Sierra Club was volunteers were very active in Prince George's and Montgomery County in helping to educate businesses on how to comply. Um, and in this example, um, you can see that when we first went by, these, we went to, um, excuse me, shopping centers, all those little dots on the map of Prince George's County, uh, Central and Northern Prince George's County, where shopping centers and volunteers went just right down the sidewalk into each and every business and spoke, uh, spoke with the manager who was there um, and asked them whether they were aware of the phone ban and whether they had any phone, not to report anybody, but just to help them comply. And you can see the purple um, bars, the first round, it was about well, three quarters, depending on <clears throat> what kind of business it was. And the pharmacies had a very low, um, like the Walgreens and the CVS has had very low um, compliance rate. Uh, but when we, went, when we came back um, later in the year, this is in 2017, um, after having pro provided that information, we were up over 90%. Um, we found basically the same thing in Montgomery County. And I know that Marilyn Noman is gonna have more to say about this and how they did it. Um, so Montgomery County also, um, what we went to um, grocery, excuse me, um, shopping centers and, and did the exact same thing. Um, Gaithersburg, each of the municipalities in Montgomery County had to pass a separate ban, which is why we have Gaithersburg separate there. So the good news is that it isn't really a tough sell um, that the, the, main, the main constraint that we found as volunteers is just keeping up with the changing, the turnover in businesses and the turnover in managers um, and employees. Hi, okay, thank you, Martha. I mean, this is an amazing amount of research that you've done and, and it is very encouraging. And I would like to introduce our first panelist. Uh, John Sullivan has been program manager for the Dep Maryland Department of Environment, MDE, Resource Program Management, uh, Resource Management Program since 2016. In his role, John oversees the functions of Maryland's Hazardous Waste Program, Waste Diversion Division, Biosolids Division, Animal Feed Operations, and the Statewide Recycling Program. John has been working closely with MDE leadership to implement and support Governor Hogan's executive order regarding waste reduction and resource recovery. This executive order adopts a first ever sustainable materials management policy for Maryland that will aim to minimize environmental impact throughout the entire life cycle. In addition, <clears throat> John acts as MDE's agricultural liaison to Maryland's Department of Agriculture and previously served as the liaison to the Hartford County Agricultural Industry on behalf of the County Executive, County Council, and local delegation. He represents MDE on the State Soil Conservation Committee and is past president of the Maryland Agricultural Council and Maryland Agricultural Educational Foundation. John has a Bachelor's of Science from York College of Pennsylvania and lives in Falston, Maryland. Welcome, John. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate um, this outreach effort and it uh, 
sort of uh, works hand in glove with our outreach effort. A um, little more about my background. Uh, I've had the pleasure of uh, working with uh, EPA's Chesapeake Bay program office uh, in a two year stint. It was a, an overblown internship uh, fresh out of college. Um, I also had the opportunity to work for the National Civilian Community Corps where I worked in the Northeast uh, cleaning up environmental projects and led a team of uh, 12 diverse students uh, in the Northeast for an 18-month stint. Um, I've spent my entire career serving the citizens of Maryland and uh, pretty proud of it. Uh, there are four county executives and uh, two governors and the EPA and the National Lane Community Corps. So I'm pretty proud of that, and I'm really glad to be uh, working with uh, Maryland Department of the Environment. And as you described, the resource management program is pretty diverse. Um, serving hazardous waste communities, <laughs> um, a huge segment of our poultry industry, uh, the waste diversion division and biosolids. It's, uh, it's a pretty diverse uh, community that uh, I try to uh, serve and protect the environment on. Um, with regard to the um, polystyrene ban, uh, it's been a, I think, a successful rollout. Um, in terms of public outreach, I uh, reached out to every county executive, county council president, county administrator, public school system, chamber of commerces. Uh, my mailing list was approximately 400 people across the state. Um, with regard to waivers, I did receive a few requests. Um, none have been granted um, because really the waiver, you have to be very unique in uh, your circumstances and none have presented that type of information to me. Um, Governor Hogan did issue um, and Secretary Grumbles did issue an executive order uh, which extended the use of styrofoam containers that were purchased prior to July 1 and allowing businesses and food service industries to utilize that product up to October 1st or until the state of emergency has been lifted, whichever comes first. So it might not necessarily be October 1st. Uh, it might come before that if the state of emergency is lifted and restaurants and bars and food service industries are allowed to, to reopen fully. Um, I continue to do public outreach. Information is on our website, frequently asked questions. Fact sheet is on our website. Um, I get questions every day and try to respond in a timely manner. Um, MDE is primarily working from home, uh, but I receive a voicemail message or an email every once in a while, and I try to respond in a timely fashion. I'm glad that counties are doing their part to enforce this. I do hear from constituents that they're glad that this ban has taken effect. Um, they're tired of seeing styrofoam cups on the side of the roads and in storm drains. So I hear from quite a few folks that they're excited that this is taking place 
but with regard to enforcement, it's up to counties. Uh, the bill specifically names health departments and um, environmental departments, and typically environmental departments are a division of a Department of Public Works. So, for example, I'm from Harford County. In Harford County, we have a local health department, but we also have a environmental division of the Department of Public Works. And it's up to the county to decide who's going to do enforcement. Um, but I've done outreach to all levels of county government to make them informed, and I am sending constant communication to them. We have um, MDE has regular meetings with recycling managers and DPW managers in, within county government uh, on a regular basis. Well, that's great, John. We're going to open it up for questions after we've heard from Marilyn, but uh, that's terrific that there's been so much rollout already and that you're getting uh, positive feedback. Over 400 uh, outreaches prior to the first of the year, and then probably 50 plus since the first of the year communications. Uh, there's there's turnover in county government, so I get to meet new directors of Department of Public Works and health departments uh, constantly, and I update them on uh, the most current information available. We'll be back to you with questions. Some are already queued up, but let's let's Perfect. let's hear from Marilyn, uh, and then we'll we'll open it up. Um, so, I'd like to now introduce um, Marilyn Noman. She is the associate director of resource the resource recovery division for Prince George's County's um, Department of the Environment. She's manager of landfill operations certified a certified public manager and holds a degree in business administration. She has over 30 years of experience with the Prince George's County Department of the Environment with more than 25 of those years, specifically in the areas of recycling and waste management. She leads a division of 120 employees and has responsibility for the operations of a materials recycling facility, organics composting facility, an active municipal municipal sanitary landfill, a closed landfill, two public convenience centers, and household hazardous waste and electronics collection. She also oversees the county's residential recycling, trash, and organics. Um, their curbside collections, including bulk pickup services for 174,000 over, excuse me, over Maryland, over 174,000 households and businesses and, uh, and multifamily recycling programs. So welcome, Marilyn. Thank, thank you, Martha. Good to be with everyone this morning. Um, I haven't conducted any public speaking in about three months or maybe more since COVID, um, but I was very pleased to respond favorably to Martha's request for this very important um, you know, environmental um, new law that we have here in the state of Maryland. Um, Prince George's County passed a law several years ago, and I, I must admit that the Sierra Club and thank Martha profusely for helping Prince George's County with our rollout, especially with the notification of the businesses, um, the, you know, the managers and the owners about the, the, the law that was passed in Prince George's County. And, and with that, I will say that the, the outreach that the counties um, conduct and, and that type of communication that you have with your, your business and commercial sector within your respective counties is so important. And we, we're finding now during this period of COVID-19 that while we're not our inspectors, um, we specifically have recycling inspectors, while they're not um, visiting in person at the businesses for obvious reasons, we are focusing very much um, on outreach. And there's so many different ways that the counties can do effective outreach uh, at little to no cost. Now, some of the things we did, obviously, and I'll go through those, have a higher cost than others. But one of the first things that, that the counties should think about 
is having your outreach, you know, what you're going to do, what types of pieces of information you're going to develop. I recommend uh, obviously working very closely with your communication team. Your communications teams might be located within your respective department. It, it might be your county's um, outreach communication staff members, but sort of have those pieces developed. And um, with that, I'm, I'm, I'll go into the order of sort of what Prince George's County did prior to our enforcement. Um, so the first thing we did was we added information onto the county's website. Now our website here in Prince George's County is forever being improved upon, but it was very important that we, we made sure we had information out there on the website. And um, we worked very closely with the county's call center as well, um, so that they would know um, to direct people to the website. And also we provided the call center with some additional information to help our agency answer questions. Um, we developed a phone free postcard. So I'm not sure if, if you can um, have that postcard put up on the screen. Now this postcard, now this was one of the items that is a little more expensive that I realize, you know, perhaps it's not in county budgets to do, but we did a direct mailing to the business sector. But I will say that going um, and distributing this uh, postcard, it was a very large size postcard directly to the businesses was, I would say, just as effective as the direct mail. And I will share with you one of the issues we did have here in our county with direct mail is we had quite a few of the postcards returned to us. But you know, the Sierra Club helped us with, with um, going out to the various shopping centers and handing this out. We partnered with our um, Department of uh, Permitting, Inspections and Enforcement, which is a separate department than the Department of Environment, which is where um, I work and our inspectors work, which is different from our Department of Public Works. Um, but they are deep high um, inspectors helped because they're going out to the various businesses because they're inspecting for other types of things, but they're out there. So they were more than happy when they were meeting with either a manager or a, a business owner to you know, drop this postcard in the hands of, of that person. And obviously it was posted on our website and Sierra Club, uh, I may have already mentioned it, but this is one of the main pieces of information in addition to our FAQs that they also help distribute in person. Now I realize with, with the COVID that, you know, counties may not be in the position right now to have staff go and physically put this in the hands of people and mail might be prohibitive, but there's a lot of other avenues um, to, to get this in, information distributed. Again, it, you know, your website, if your county's engaging in Nextdoor app or a Facebook page, um, it, it, the health department, we realize the health departments are very busy right now with the COVID-19, um, you know, all the work involved with that. And I can't even say enough about that, but um, they're out there. The health department is out in the communities. They're out at businesses. And if you could partner with your health departments to at least get this information or whatever it is that you develop to notify the businesses. I think it, that's very important and I believe it's gonna help your county significantly. Because one of the things I, I really wanted to point out for the counties that might not be able to get, you know, the information out or, you know, just doesn't, you know, um, you know maybe it's a lack of resources or, or what have you. What I'm afraid we're gonna find in the state of Maryland, you're going to have some counties that get this information out very robustly um, might even migrate at some point into the inspections and enforcement and businesses will get the message and by and large, they do want to do the right thing. Um, and I'll get into that in a minute about doing the right thing. But what I'm afraid of is for the counties that, you know, approach this very robustly, they're going to see success and the counties that might not be as vocal about it or, you know, where the information is just generally not known what you might witness is some businesses and counties transferring that product, i.e. the polystyrene or the styrofoam to their businesses in other counties. Um, and I have to say, we, I did witness a little bit of that 
here between Prince George's County, some businesses and other counties, um, you know, that, I, that I've been in, in in Maryland once our, our, our ban went into effect and we were um, literally enforcing it. Um, the FAQ, so if you wanna show the FAQs on, on the screen. The FAQs was a very important piece of information that we shared with all of our staff as, as well as our call center. And it helped tremendously for, you know, anyone that's getting that phone call that has, you know, from a, a person that has a question about um, what exactly is this, it really does help the receiver of the call to be able to help answer questions. Of course, anything any more technical than what we provided on the FAQs would then be um, uh, either transferred or, you know, our direct lines would be provided. But the FAQs, um, again, here you could develop as in depth or as a general as each county, um, you know, really wanted to depict this information based on the state's, the state's law. But um, again, the FAQs we find are extremely helpful. Um, so I, I, I touched a little bit about enforcement and the, and the success in Prince George's County. So we do, we, we have the ability um, within our law, and it's in the state's law as well, for enforcement and issuing a violation. And literally, um, we have violations that look like the old speeding tickets, if anyone ever got a speeding ticket or, or um, you know, just generally a, a traffic violation. Now we are migrating over to um, an automated system where we'll have one of those heat thermal um, printouts of the violation. Um, but I, I must say that here in Prince George's County, we had a high success rate. We may have issued a few violations. The violation itself does not carry a civil citation. Um, and we did not have to issue any civil citations at all. Um, because after a violation notice was issued, um, every business that you know, again, we had few that this actually had to occur, but they did come into compliance. I, I will say that, um, you know, again, communication is very, very important. Um, with respect to the large chain businesses, um, I don't, I don't want to, like, I'm going to go ahead and just mention what I, what, I, what I mean by chain, like the McDonald's, the, the um, Starbucks, the Dunkin' Donuts, um, Chick-fil-A's of the world. Um, you might find that they want to refer your staff member to their corporate office. The corporate offices are, it's very difficult to actually get a person on the other end of the phone. So my recommendation is if that happens is for um, your employee to ask for their, for the regional manager and sort of go up the chain and not just um, settle with call the corporate office because it is again, very hard to reach um, someone in the corporate office. Um, what else do I wanna say about that? Um, again, this, the success rate was, was very high in Prince George's County. Communication was, was key. Grace period. So um, we, as, as MDE stated, we did not, um, we, we have granted no waivers. However, in our county, um, our law was written such that we do have the leeway to grant a grace period. And, and what that is used for is we had some business and, and actually our schools, our public schools are a perfect example. So when our law went into effect, they had a, a very large amount of polystyrene um, lunch trays and breakfast trays um, that their procurement officer had already purchased for they do very large purchases and it might be, you know, like a six month supply at a time. And, and we found some of our businesses were in, in the same situation. So as not to cause a financial um, hardship, which might then go into that waiver request, perhaps the county, we allowed for a grace period um, for a certain number of either weeks or months to um, sort of use their stock but then they, they really had to show to our inspectors that during their next procurement, they would be definitely not procuring a polystyrene product. And we always, of course, did a follow-up visit to those businesses that we, had, that we allowed a grace period. 
So I, I do think, you know, if you have some leeway to work with your commercial sector, um, because they, I do believe firmly, they want to do the right thing. Um, most, most people today are very concerned about the environment um, and, and they're concerned about what their customers think about their business. So they want to comply. Um, so I think that grace period, you know, again, a month, two months, three months might be very important with working with them to bring them into compliance. Um, and the other thing I just went, really wanted to touch on is it's a, it is important to go back out, it, you know, to periodically check on a business because we did have some that came into compliance um, and these generally were smaller businesses, like what I would call a mom pop operation. And, you know, a six month later visit revealed that they had the polystyrene back on their shelves and they were using it, um, you know, obviously to serve food in for customers. And, and that might go to what Martha was, was touching on that. Sometimes the management, there's a high turnover rate sometimes and that the message may have been lost about the, you know, the, the ban on a certain product. Um, Martha, did I, I think I covered just about everything here for Prince George's County. My main point is communications and outreach is key. There's a lot of things that can be done that doesn't cost a lot of money and that can be done remotely, um, especially in this time right now that we're going through with COVID-19. And um, yeah, so I think I, with that, uh, Martha, I will wait and see uh, what questions might come in specifically to how um, Prince George has rolled out their um, phone free and PGC. Um, you know, if there's any questions, and, and I'd be happy to answer. Thanks a lot, Marilyn. And um, before um, w before we go to the Q and A, I just want to take uh, a minute or two to share with you uh, some of the materials um, that Sharon Pulowski, the program manager in Food Protection Services, Anne Arundel County, uh, shared with me. And we have uh, this. We we have. Um, Gary Young with technical support here. He's gonna put up these three items. She wanted to share them with you and she said she'd be very pleased uh, to answer any questions anyone has about the Anne Arundel ban, which is mainly enforced through the health department. Um, she'd be glad if I collect those questions to answer them um, and we could get back to you with those questions, with the answers. This is their, um, their flyer. Um, Gary, can you scroll down so we can see the rest of it? Just get the gist. A lot of the places have their own flyer. Um, there's also um, their website. That's like FAQs and a flyer. So they have a very good website there. And then they also um, developed a template for the warning. Since, since it, this was launched right as the COVID came out, um, they kind of put a pause on the enforcement, but, um, but they did have a template. So, um, you know, it's a generic, it's a template, and they were planning to use that to notify people of uh, a violation. We can open up for questions. Justin from Hartford County, the Hartford County Health Department. Um, he says, has there been, have there been any, any effort, this is uh, directed to John um, Sullivan, have there been any efforts to restrict the online sale or delivery of foam food containers to Maryland residences? He said, I would assume that residents who want to use foam will just order their foam products online for home delivery and those products ultimately would end up in the environment as was the case before the ban. John, do you want to comment that's, on that? That sounds about accurate to me. Uh, Martha, you might have a different read on it, but uh, not much I can do about online sales. Um, but uh, Harvard County Health Department uh, has my contact info and can certainly reach out to me uh, offline and I'll gladly help them through the process if they have any further questions, but 
I don't I don't see how this bill stops that. Uh, certainly not in your residence. Yeah, I would imagine that the residences wouldn't be ordering large quantities, uh, even if they were giving away food uh, at no. a charitable event. It, giving out no. food is also providing food even for free in a foam container is not allowed under this bill. So um, I suppose it's possible. I don't know how common it is. No, I, I doubt enforcement's going to be taking place in residential right. situations. Okay, we have another question um, from the Eastern Shore from Cindy. Who will be responsible for imposing the fines? John? That's up to the county. Um, as the FAQ states, uh, first step is a warning. Second step is uh, for the inspector to come back out 90 days later and see if they're still using it. And then they can issue a fine and the local government is to notify my office of said violation. And I intend to develop a database of um, counties or businesses that have been in violation so that when asked, I can provide that list, but there's been none to date, of course. Okay. Um, what does, um, this is from actually um, from Montgomery County. What does NDE um, believe to be the biggest obstacle to um, implementation of the statewide ban across counties? Probably enforcement. Um, as I stated previously, I've reached out to every county government and school system and chamber of commerce in the state and hospitals and universities, but it's up to the county to do the enforcement. And that would be the biggest obstacle would be enforcement. One of the one of the there is quite a bit of confusion I found, and the next questioner is is reflecting that the the county that she's living in uh, believes that the whole ban has been pushed to October. Uh, not they're not realizing that the the sale of um, the sale of foam food containers is is banned as of July first. Is there anything that MDE is doing specifically to to correct that impression? Um, my outreach efforts. Uh, which have included every single request for a waiver I've responded to and I have sent the uh, updated uh, executive order to my initial mailing list of approximately 400. And, and as you stated earlier, very, at the very beginning of this presentation, outreach is key. Well, there, another question's been asked um, from um, Cecil Cantania Adams. Will MDE be providing a flyer for counties to use to help with outreach and education about the ban? I've emailed the uh, FAQ and um, it's basically a a flyer for a restaurant or food service business to place in their uh, business. And if anybody needs that, um, my email address is john.sullivan, the number one at maryland.gov, and I'll be glad to provide that. And uh, thanks to the Sierra Club for helping us with this outreach effort. Great. Brenda Denny from Carroll County says, um, does the ban apply to charitable events such as church events? I think that would be food service. Yes, I've been asked that many times. It's food service. Uh, I get and that question quite Volunteer fire companies, church groups. Um, one of the things that um, Maryland did not Maryland did not mention, but I know to be true, <laughs> is that they they translated their frequently asked questions into multiple languages. I think it was uh, Korean, Spanish, um, 
even French, Amharic, a whole lot of languages, Chinese especially. There were, because a lot of the mom and pop and the ethnic restaurants, they don't, they can't really understand the handout. Is there any plan, John, to, um, to translate your FAQs, into, especially Spanish and Chinese? I do not have that in the works. Um, I do have just the ESP band flyer in Spanish, uh, but I do not have the FAQ in any other language, but I can look into that. That's all right. That would be terrific. So Marilyn, if I understand it correctly, you've never actually had to find anyone, is that correct? That is correct. Fantastic. We, we, I mean, we, we had, um, it was a very large supplier, restaurant supplier here in the county um, that I will not name, but we had, a, you know, we, we did have some pushback. It, it took a couple of visits, including um, our director paid a visit to to the business. And um, with that, they, they came into compliance and um, we periodically go back and make sure they're in compliance. But um, yeah, we didn't actually have to go through the process of a violation and a citation, which then would potentially or could lead us into court. Um, so, you know, we did have a couple of cases that took some effort, more effort than, you know, some special cases, let's call it. But, but we are, and, and, and Prince George's, we are fully prepared um, and our staff have been trained to be able to, and to know how to issue a violation if needed. Okay, I've got a question here, question here from Julie Sabatino in Charles County. She says, um, when she's been shopping online, She's often seen notices that a state for a state or that state that an item cannot be shipped to certain states. Now, why can't that apply to the phone ban as it is um, since it's statewide? It seems that it would be effective, especially if the really large companies like Amazon are notified. Are you still with us, Sean? I am, but I, I don't know that I have an answer to that question. Perhaps you and I can follow up. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Um, we, we can continue, John, we're sorry to lose you to this other call. Um, if anyone else has questions for John, um, Marilyn, um, now's the time. Marilyn, are the, are the inspectors actually um, working through the COVID epidemic? And um, so, the recycle our collections inspectors, yes, yeah, so on the track, sort of like on the collection side of the house. But our recycling inspectors who enforce um, the the business recycling laws, as well as um, several different bans on uh, mainly polystyrene and some plastic products that the county has, they they are not um, they have not been um, they were deemed non essential during the COVID nineteen. So right now they're divert it to doing other work. However, with that said, our communications team, um, being that they're teleworking, you know, again, they are really keeping our website up to date. Um, you know, we have the, some other, uh, we're working on the plastic straw ban information right now. So we're very busy with communications. And I, I would also add that right now, um, especially during this COVID-19 and not really doing as much face-to-face -face, um, and making a phone call and, and really communicating sort of like the old fashioned way by phone that a lot of people tend to have gotten away from, it seems like over the past several or more years, but just even picking up the telephone and making phone calls really goes a long way because it, it, it really has a, a very personal touch to it. All right, now Marilyn, there's another question here for you. One of the um, participants is asking, do you think it's necessary for each county to develop its own FAQs and or postcards rather than use the, M, the MDE materials, their FAQs? Um, I mean, I think it's, I, it's, I think it's definitely an option 
Um, but, you know, I mean, it, the, the state, I think, will provide more of a, a general, um, you know, couple of pieces of outreach, for instance. And, you know, a county, I would think, would have the ability to perhaps generate and create um, some additional pieces of outreach um, and, and can really package it, you know, to fit their county and, and, you know, put their county seal on it and, or their departmental, you know, logo. And so I, I would highly encourage taking what, you know, maybe using some of what MDE has provided, but, you know, creating, you know, get your graphics artists um, involved and, you know, and some of your specialists, whether it's the health department or your environmental um, or recycling team and, and, and generate some outreach. And now is really a perfect time to do it with, you know, we have staff that are teleworking and, and quite frankly, I, I would imagine other counties are in the same position. You know, there's some people who are teleworking that have tons of work to do and they're extremely busy, but you know, we have staff that really are sort of looking for some additional things to get involved with because they might not be, you know, busy for the full eight hours. And, um, so, you know, I just, you know, I would keep that in mind and maybe, you know, pull in some of your, your staff, um, especially if you have staff that, you know, would like to do this exact kind of thing, you know, develop, you know, some information and outreach. Um, and of course that would be vetted then through your, your formal communications team. But I, I would highly encourage, you know, each county to come up with some of their own materials and not necessarily reinvent the wheel, but even see what maybe some of the other counties have done. And, um, you know, I think for the most part, counties generally don't mind other counties sort of, you know, using some of their information or um, I don't really want to say copying it, but, um, you know, I highly encourage, encourage the counties to come up with some of their own um, outreach. And, and you may, yeah. yeah, and you may very well have a staff member um, who can do some of those translations that you need that might take a bit longer for the state, um, you know, to accomplish and get out to the county. So, yeah, I encourage it strongly. I think that the counties that are starting it now really uh, have the advantage of being able to look at the literature that Prince George's, Montgomery, Anne Arundel, and the city of Baltimore also has a phone ban and the MDE materials, um, just not having to start from scratch is really, really helpful. Mm -hmm. um, but like you said, I think that the, the translation is something that, and you're talking about outreach, that's, that's one of the big uh, obstacles to reaching certain kinds of food service establishments. Mm -hmm. um, and so could be worthwhile. Um, um, Cindy is asking if the PowerPoint slides will be provided. To participants? Uh, sure. We're, this is being recorded and we will have a recording. We will have um, the PowerPoints. We will also have um, the answers to questions. We'll circulate a Q&A from, um, from the event. Um, we'd really, you know, in closing, we'd really uh, like to thank our two panelists, John Sullivan and Marilyn Noman, for speaking today, and all of you who attended. Um, we know that you're really busy during this challenging time, and we hope this event has provided information, ideas, and contacts that will save you time and result in a smooth rollout of the phone ban in your counties. And Sierra Club volunteers are willing to, to help as well, although right now, we can't really go door to door to businesses, but when things settle down, there are other ways we can try to help as volunteers. Um, so we will preparing, be preparing complete Q&A from the discussion um, based on your questions. If you have more questions, you can send them to me. Also, if you have questions for, the, uh, for Sharon and Anne Arundel County about the way they've rolled out, I'd be glad to pass them on. Um, PowerPoint and YouTube of the meeting. Many thanks to Gary Young for his technical support. Thanks to all of you for your time today. <laughs> Good luck on your phone ban rollout and stay safe. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you.